All right, all right. Thanks for tuning in. This is Scott with the Crescent Method. We're here again for our Wednesday night, seven o'clock live stream. Uh, we were doing the Science Bro for a bit, but um, you know we had some requests to move into a little bit of a different concept. So we're doing Surviving the Crash because just to be point blank, it's pretty wild out there right now. So uh, just want to say what's up to a few people in the chat. What's up, Gracie Jiu Jitsu? Let's make that a little bit bigger so we can see. Change the game with extracts. That is what is up. What is up, Southern Oregon Soil dropping in again. Jonathan Moore knows what's up. Extracts for the win. So we just wanted to get right into it. Uh, the purpose of today is to try and um, you know, manage the requests of the people that are watching the show. And there was some comments that, um, you know, we uh, talked about indoor cultivation, which was kind of funny. I just slipped into what I know and, you know, started talking about indoor. And there's a whole bunch more out there. There's greenhouse, there's outdoor. And so today the goal is to try and convey some of the concepts and obstacles with greenhouse cultivation uh, with regards to surviving the future era of cannabis. Uh, so I guess we could uh, just jump right in. We've got a little uh, presentation for you here. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and start out with kind of go from worst to best, I guess you could say. So this is a uh, sealed greenhouse with an external depth curtain. Um, I'm still baffled that this stuff is Ill is legal. I mean, I feel like this is like the lawn dart of the uh, greenhouse world. And um, I don't know, man, like every single farm I've seen with an external depth has this type of thing happen. They get a big windstorm and it blows up and everybody gets terrified. Um, people are afraid they're going to die. Um, thousands of dollars of shit is destroyed and um, they just flat out suck ass. We'll just, we'll just be clear. Um, I've, uh, <laughs> it's been a long day, fam. Southern Oregon says I look baked. Um, it's been a long one. That's for sure. Uh, we've been on the phone for probably uh, 12 hours today. Um, so yeah, I'm a little bit tired, not gonna lie, but we said we were going to do this. So smoked a little bit of, uh, this year's outdoor crop to kind of get me in the mood <laughs> and we're bringing it to you. Uh, but anyways, external depths, hundred percent of the time they're problematic. There's light leaks. Uh, we had a farmer this slash season that we worked with. that was like hands down one of the most amazing humans I've ever worked with. And he had an external depth and four harvests in a row had problems. Um, the plants start revegging. Um, it's just, it's heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. So I can't get with any sort of, um, external depth stuff. People tend to get into these cause they think they're going to save money and you end up just losing everything and people get terrified that they're going to die. So that sucks. Um, second thing that I would never consider messing with is glass. This is one of the most interesting phenomenons with uh, cannabis and people keep saying that we need glass because glass has a higher transmission rate, which is an accurate statement. Um, anytime you put a greenhouse cover, whether it be glass, plastic, polyweave film, the sunlight has to pass through it and it's going to filter it to a certain degree. And so you're gonna lose some of that sunlight. And so people always champion that glass is, you know, has a higher transmission rate. So you get more of that sun in there. And then everybody quotes this like really obsc obscure statement from, I think it's Rosenthal from like the mid nineties. And he claims in some study that he got more THC under a glass greenhouse. And I just, I have not seen that to be the case one single time at all. Um, and I don't, you know, I gotta be real careful talking about this stuff because there's some people running glass greenhouses that I like, and we've worked with some uh, people in some glass greenhouses, but hands down, worst choice, please do not put your cannabis under a glass greenhouse. What ends up happening in real life is that added transmission stresses out the plant because it's in the UVB spectrum, I believe. So it's the higher transmission is coming from light waves that degrade, stress out your cannabis and cause it to sweat and transpire. And so what ends up happening in these glass greenhouses is People believe this kind of like BS story from Ed Rosenthal um, from back in the 90s with no factual basis or study or pictures or it's just like literally a statement and a quote that everybody's spending millions of dollars based off of. And uh, 
what actually happens is that higher transmission stresses the hell out of the plant. They end up sweating. You end up absolutely fighting mother nature in every way possible. Um, a lot of these gla glass greenhouses are aimed to be sealed and um, you know climate controlled. And the reality is you put a bunch of glass under the sun, there isn't a piece of equipment on this planet that can actually control that environment. Um, so in this situation, they at least got some ridge vents. Um, but for the sake of cannabis, what ends up happening is <clears throat> they end up having to put like 30%, 40%, 60% shade cloth just to get it to a point where the plants aren't stressed out so that they stop sweating out and creating this like ridiculous mold box. Uh, we worked with a glass greenhouse in like 20, early 2017, I think it was, and their average um, trash bin rate of their finished flowers is about 30%. So everybody claims you get like 5% better transmission, but the reality is you end up throwing away like 20 to 30% of your crop and they end up putting a 30% shade cloth. So in order to get this 2% increase in sunlight transmission, you put a 30% shade cloth just to make it manageable. And even then it's just like a bud rot festival and you throw out 20 to 30% of your crop. It's the most insane thing I've ever seen in person. Everybody keeps going along with it. I'm not real sure why, um, but it just doesn't make any sense from like a greenhouse consideration. These glass greenhouses come from, you know, Europe and the Netherlands where it's very foggy and the daylight integer as they call it is much lower. And so they need that higher transmission. Um, you know, there was a greenhouse you know, in the United States that was built and the uh, owner of that greenhouse had a, had a um, designer from the Netherlands, I believe it was, come out. And the guy straight up told him, do not put a glass greenhouse under this intense sun. You will lose your ass. And the guy built it anyways. And that facility has killed the careers of two extremely talented greenhouse cultivators. Some other guys went in there and started having a really good job. But then another glass greenhouse uh, headhunted them dudes and took them away put them in another greenhouse that was glass that was having a hell of a time holding it together. So I don't really know what it is with glass, but I've, I mean, you know, I think I know of like two or three people that are able to make this manageable, not successful, but manageable. It's really expensive. It's just with the electricity to try and cool this and the loss, like this is never going to make it into the future. 0% chance of a glass greenhouse surviving past the crash, in my opinion. Uh, this is another big uh, greenhouse style. This is called a gable, or um, uh, they connect here at the gutters. And this is really common in agriculture where they're very large. And, um, you know, here it looks like the ends roll up. It doesn't look like the sides roll up. At least they do have a ridge vent, so at least the hot air can get out. But the only air coming in is from the ends, and it's likely these are 100 to 120 foot long greenhouses. They might have a walkway and another 120 foot. So it's very likely that this end greenhouse goes another 240 feet the other direction. So this is probably 30 or 42 feet wide. So you've got a 3,250 square foot greenhouse with a eight to 10 foot walkway and another 3,200 square foot greenhouse. And the only air getting into that building is through this end. And what you end up happening, what ends up happening is the center is just a disaster full of bugs and mold, and it's just, that's where all the problems coalesce. Um, you know, at certain scales, it's responsible, you know, it's reasonable to do these large gutter connected greenhouses. And the reason why they build these is because you save on construction costs and building materials. So every time you attach them at the center, you're saving on a wall, you're saving on foundation supports, you're saving on connectors, uh, divider curtains. And so there's a reasonable financial, um, savings in the beginning to move to this style. But from our analysis, every day fourth, it's more expensive. Uh, at least this one has a ridge vent, like I said, but these end plants are going to be overly dried out because they're trying to get the wind in there to get some cooling. And all the plants in the center are going to be fairly problematic. Uh, in my opinion, if you do something this large, I wouldn't go more than two or three at a time. Uh, we've seen some really cool setups like this designed by actual cannabis cultivators uh, where they put almost like a lung room hallway in the center. That actually works fairly well. But again, they don't have more than two of them attached together at a time because it just gets way too hostile in there. And kind of the weird part about cannabis and where we're at in the world is um, 
you know, we're using guidelines from other plants that have no contextual similarities to regulated cannabis. So regulated cannabis is tested for typically 62 pesticides, environmental contaminants, health parameters, and heavy metals. And none of these situations where greenhouse in this configuration is used for other areas of agriculture, are those plants subject to this level of scrutiny. And so we have this entire industry built upon farms that are very literally using really nasty toxic chemicals to control the plant health problems that arise in these type of megastructures that are just really a hostile environment. Uh, it looks like maybe at least this is frosted. Um, so it's at least maybe diffused, it could just be dirty. Sometimes they whitewash them with uh, calcium carbonate, which is kind of crazy. Um, but uh, all in all, you know, I wouldn't go that I wouldn't do this massive uh, floor plan for cannabis for sure. And then this is kind of like uh, the concept of like what most cannabis cultivators believe they need. And coming from a previously illegal market, everything was very hidden. And even in California that has a long history of prop 215 and, you know, kind of quasi gray area legal cultivation where people were able to put greenhouses across the state, a very small percentage was actually able to put outdoor greenhouses of like legitimate structures. A lot of the greenhouses in the kind of Prop 215 era were basic hoop houses, kind of makeshift shelters, a lot of like backyard, halfway hidden, homemade structures. And there weren't a lot of regions at all where you were able to build like an engineered legitimate greenhouse and so up here where we live in grass valley that was one of the areas they were able to do it and so there's a you know pretty solid history of people operating greenhouses in this area and some of the outskirts of humboldt and all that um, region there was people putting greenhouses but a lot of times they were non-permitted structures so they were more like pvc um, hoop houses not traditional greenhouses. And so when you really like look at cannabis from start to finish, how much cannabis has been produced for how long, and then the percentage of that actual cultivation space that was in a legitimate engineer greenhouse is very, 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 very small. And so we're still kind of in this weird area where, you know, like um, some of the greenhouse companies that actually used cannabis to design their process and design the greenhouses based on actual cannabis cultivation. There's a few slices of those, but like most of cannabis is still growing in grossly inappropriate structures for the context of cannabis regulated or not. And so you have a majority of the people coming from in an indoor environment. So you're taking an indoor cultivator and now putting them into a greenhouse. And the first thing that they want is they want to be able to control that environment. And I can tell you the only thing that you can really control is you know, how much money you pay to the electric bill. It's just absolutely insane. And, you know, it's very common to see like ten to $20,000 electric bills on a basic 2,000 square foot, you know, greenhouse of this type that's sealed. And so point blank, like you, you can't, you can't out engineer, or out electrify or out blow or out fan mother nature. Uh, the American Greenhouse Society or National Greenhouse Engineers Board or whatever the hell they're called, um, says that in order to not have solar gain, which is the heating up of air from sun beating on it when it's trapped in, you have to have a full room air exchange every second. And so this looks like a pretty standard, like, you know, 30 by 100 or something. At max, this is a 2,000 square foot greenhouse. Looks like they got a couple 30 inch fans. There's a 0% chance that this fan is going to, this, those two fans are gonna evacuate this building every second to not have an increase in temperature from solar gain. On top of that, it's a clear building, so it's going to increase, increase transmission and stress out the plants. On top of that, it doesn't look like there's a ridge vent. There might be on the other side, but I don't think so. And so what's gonna actually happen is air is gonna naturally rise through, through convection, try to go to the peak. And if it can't immediately leave out of the top, then it starts to stew and swirl and slowly drop in temperature and kind of fall down. And then it might get sucked out by the fan. And you've got this kind of like 
kind of whirlpool effect that goes on inside these greenhouses. And so it can be loud as all get out with these fans. Plants can actually even be moving because there's so much disturbance. But like if you light some incense or hit a DJ fog machine, you'll see that the air is not even leaving the building. And so you end up with an extremely hostile environment for the, con the, for the context of cannabis because the air has nowhere to go. Uh, on top of that, in the new era of, of cannabis with, you know, ever decreasing wholesale prices, there's just, um, you know, fairly small chance that you're going to survive as a business moving forward with a greenhouse that does not have a ridge vent, that's mechanically ventilated, that has clear sidewalls. Uh, it's just, this is financially, you know, a greenhouse set up like this or in the grass or the glass greenhouse, you might be like eight to $900 all in cost on your per pound. And you need to be at like the two to $400 range. I think it was back in 2017, I was doing a, uh, a uh, workshop up here in Grass Valley. And I was having a conversation with a guy that owned several properties and he was renting some properties and owned some greenhouses on rental properties. And he was talking about one in particular that had about four hoop houses. Uh, that they were nice cold frames. They were built out for cannabis, had depth, internal depth curtains, but they didn't have a ridge vent. And he was going through some arguments with the, the farm manager that was on that property and the landlord that owned it. And he literally walked away from four greenhouses that he built, paid for, were operational and functioning. And, you know, he simply put, said, I don't want to ever spend another dollar on a greenhouse that doesn't have a ridge vent. And even though I've paid for these greenhouses on this property, I'm willing to walk away from them completely because in the next three to five years, it will not be financially viable to even operate these greenhouses. So I'm actually money ahead to completely walk away from structures than to try and hold on to them, fight the landlord, and hope that when prices drop below $1,000 per pound on the wholesale market that I'll be able to survive. And that was something that like really stuck with me that somebody who's willing to walk away from, you know, thirty dollars to $40,000 in equipment because of what he saw coming forward with market prices and the impending, you know, crash, so to speak, of the market. So this um, is kind of like what a lot of cannabis farmers believe they want and need, and the industry kind of supports moving forward with this, and it's just a, kind of a disaster. Uh, what also ends up happening in the case of soil-based systems, which we deal with a lot, is when the humidity starts to rise in these, in these greenhouses and the air isn't properly evacuated, in the corners of the greenhouse, you end up getting stagnation. And so in the back corners by the wet wall, in the corners of the greenhouse, it'll stay perpetually anaerobic and you will have um, mite pressure and mold pressure in the back corners up against the wet wall where the air is not moving. And when you add a wet wall to a greenhouse situation in an effort to try and cool it down, adding that moisture to the, to the space, in my opinion, what I think is happening is it plugs up the stomata of the plants and they're not able to transpire correctly. At minimum, it completely throws the VPD chart off the, out the window. And so the plant isn't able to move nutrients. And so you often see functional calcium deficits or deficiencies where the plant is not able to transpire correctly and move nutrients through sweating. Uh, also in the, in the living soil community, when that wet wall is putting so much moisture on that back wall, you, uh, the, the soil doesn't, well, I guess the plant's not using up that moisture. So the water you put into that pot isn't leaving in the same way that it's leaving in its neighbors that are using that water transpire. And best I can guess is that the plants don't use the water in the pot because they're not able to transpire because that back microclimate is already so remarkably humid. Um, up in the front by the uh, fans, you see the plants get dysfunctionally dried out because there's so much airflow moving around up here in this region that those plants end up using their using water more because they're actually being kind of treated like an evaporative cooler and the wind blowing across them causes them to transpire faster. What you end up seeing is in the back corner by the wet wall, especially towards the walls, you see mite pressure from... Uh, soil that's not 
that, that's staying waterlogged and plants that aren't able to transpire. And then in the front half of the greenhouse, you have the same mite pressure, but it's coming from the polar opposite phenomenon, which is plants that are burning through their water much faster through excessive transpiration. And so you have the spider mites or the you know, in both locations. In the case of living soil, when a plant is constantly burning through the moisture in the pot, you're drying down that soil to such a degree that you're not able to maintain very high biological populations in the soil, which reduces nutrient cycling, which then leads to things like thrips, or in the case of a hostile greenhouse, it's going to be spider mites as well, maybe both. So all in all, any sort of sealed greenhouse, in my opinion, is a complete disaster. This is, these are kind of what like the smaller home grower kind of runs into or thinks they want or has accessible to them that they're able to build. Um, I've seen structures like this a lot, uh, especially up here in Northern California. You kind of can get these locally and from the major uh, warehouse suppliers. The good thing about this greenhouse is at least the sides roll up so you can at least get air coming in but this sealed end wall is all bad news unless you're growing in the winter. And this is something that's been repeated by other greenhouse advisors for literally years in that cannabis are kind of the first cultivators or farmers to really try to use greenhouses year round. And typically a greenhouse is used for season extension, starting your plants earlier when it's cold. And so they're all gear geared towards warming the space. And we're the ones that are using these greenhouse spaces in the dead of summer in the winter mode. And so greenhouses need to be able to have a winter mode and a summer mode. So this greenhouse is like half right in that it has the sidewalls to roll up, which would be summer mode, allowing air to naturally come in. But because it doesn't have a ridge vent, there's nowhere for it to go. And what ends up happening in this greenhouse is the hot air from inside the greenhouse naturally goes straight up and it goes straight up to the peak of the ridge. And because it can't come out the top of the ridge vent or it can't even come out at the end of the greenhouse, it then again starts to swirl, it starts to whirlpool and then eventually it falls down and it'll come out the top of the door across the top of the plants in this um, footprint next to the door. If a plant, if a, if a farm has done a good job of managing canopy and they have fairly similar height plants across this greenhouse, 100% of the time, the plants by the door will be shorter. And a lot of times when we're hired to these farms to figure out why these plants are lower yielding and just lower in general, you know, they don't think that it's the hot air causing a hostile environment. And I guess either the plants are trying to not grow up into it or it's just so hostile that they're not able to transpire correctly, to move nutrients, to grow on par with their buddies. Uh, usually what I try to suggest is that people cut out this top or remove this end wall completely. If this end wall was completely removed and no material was hanging over this bar, then these rolled up sidewalls would allow the air to come in, it would go straight up to the ridge vent, and like a choo-choo train, it would roll right out the top and come out beautifully and you'd actually have fairly decent environmental control in this type of configuration. So this one's kind of half right. Uh, you've seen some people make some modifications that get hip to this and instead of having the cutout stop here, they make the cutout come all the way to the top. So when you open the barn doors, it opens all the way to the peak. And so in the event of when it's hot, you can open that greenhouse and the, the air can naturally move up through trans, uh, convection and leave right out the top, which it actually does quite rapidly when we don't impede it. Uh, one thing that's really interesting that I think most cannabis farmers haven't ever really even caught on to is that the greenhouse manufacturers send the roof several inches longer than the greenhouse structure itself on each side. And this is intended to be what's called a heat flap. And simply having the roof fabric hang over six inches on each side will increase the temperature of that greenhouse considerably. And this is one of the things that when we go to a site visit with a greenhouse like that, that we get the most cross-eyed looks. But if you have a greenhouse that the fabric is even hanging over slightly, 
you can have the farmer go stand in the center of the greenhouse and you have somebody go up there with a razor knife and cut it off real clean. And it's just like somebody opened a window and turned on a fan and everything starts rushing out. It's one of the coolest science projects that we do. And there's been a few farmers that had this situation where I literally said, dead serious, cut out a little notch or remove this thing entirely or better yet, remove this entire end wall and make sure that no flap is hanging over. And then this rolled up sidewall would work beautifully. Uh, and this is another kind of smaller version of what I talked about on the other one of what most cannabis farmers think they want. And this is a similar type of structure that you can, you know, kind of order from a big box store and have shipped to you install. And at the small scale home backyard gardener, this is kind of a fairly reasonable price point to jump into. But again, you know, this is going to be several thousand dollars of electricity every month to still not be all that enjoyable. There's no ridge vent. Uh, this one at least has roll up sidewalls, but ha having a mechanically ventilated greenhouse, which is meant to be sealed, meaning that in order to get those fans to blow the air out, that thing has to seal up completely or else the fans just blow and make a lot of noise and the air doesn't go anywhere. The second you crack this sidewall, those fans don't do anything but make noise and burn electricity. So this is kind of a, you know, kind of a corny configuration to be point blank in that there's no way you're for the um, hot air to leave from the end walls. And so as soon as you crack this sidewall up to try and get ventilation, all it's gonna do is go right from here out the fan and you're losing your suction uh, to be able to move. And so, you know, everything in the center of this is gonna be pissed off. Um, at the back wall where the air is not moving through, they're gonna be pissed off. And in the front, they're gonna be pissed off as well. So, uh, you know, again, these are two that I wouldn't mess with either. Now, these are two greenhouses that were actually designed for cannabis by actual cannabis growers in actual cannabis growing neighborhoods. And both of these greenhouses were manufactured by companies in this region where they were able to set up greenhouses for cannabis and use them effectively. And so this one on the left is kind of the original one that started working with greenhouse manufacturers to create a more cannabis friendly greenhouse. And so you can see that flexibility is key with this unit. So the sidewalls roll up. I believe this is a four up, four foot uh, sidewall, you can see the shadow is the depth curtain, which is inside. You can see that the sidewalls are solid, so it's easy to get a nice blacked out seal. Um, you can tell, see that it has a ridge vent, and so when it's hot, all you gotta do is manually roll up the sidewalls, crack the ridge vent open, and then the air naturally leaves with no, no fans. Uh, the guys that built these units figured out that if you put some horizontal, horizontal air fans and you know, turned some going north and some going south, it would create a vortex and the air would naturally leave. Uh, once it gets to a certain size, that phenomenon stops happening. But in this size greenhouse, which is uh, you know probably a 30 by 70 or something like that, it would still do that. And so you know, this type of greenhouse produces fantastic quality. And kind of the funny thing about my experience as a consultant is for the first two and a half years, we uh, consulted, you know, publicly. We worked entirely in sealed greenhouses. I didn't even see one of these greenhouses in person until I gave a lecture inside of one of these units. And um, even after giving a talk at this manufacturer's property inside of this greenhouse, we still only consulted for one or two farms that year in this style of ridge house, ridge vent greenhouse. And what's pretty interesting is that the organic cultivators that were in this style of greenhouse found that, or well, they, they might not have noticed it, but me as an analyst that would look at their soil chemistry and look at their biological data would see that this was far more forgiving to dysfunctional soil biology than a sealed greenhouse. And for a period of a year, I even worked in one of those greenhouses, uh, kind of like this guy. And I was there every single day uh, for like nine months as a main uh, director of plant health and cultivation. And it was still fairly difficult to get desirable soil food wed num soil food wed numbers in the soil because of how hostile this environment is 
and how that affects the soil. And then when I first did an analysis for somebody in this style of greenhouse, it was not really all that good, but they didn't have any powdery mildew and they had very manageable pest populations. So that was, um, you know, extremely interesting in my journey as a consultant for buildings. Uh, this one on the left is kind of a newer version of this and they, they kind of expanded upon the characteristic of this building that made sense and worked really well for cannabis. And so this unit improved by raising the sidewalls up another two feet, I believe. I think these are six foot sidewalls where this is a four foot sidewall. These might even go to eight, I'm not sure. But having that extra couple feet of sidewall to be able to roll up to get that natural convection happening above the canopy uh, is night and day benefit. Um, and uh, this is a uh, ridge vent and then it does have mechanical ventilation. And they even went a step further to put a wide garage door or shop roll-ups. So you could drive a forklift in there and actually comfortably get a pallet in there, which is nice. Uh, so this was an extremely well thought out greenhouse for cannabis cultivation that is a kind of a next evolution of this one that's, man, I don't know, maybe 12, 15 years old by now. So this is what I would do. If I was, if I was spending money on an actual building, I would go with uh, one of these and I would only gutter connect two of them. I wouldn't put more than two of them together. That'd be my personal preference of everything that I've seen, which has been every one of these very intimately many times over many spaces. We've, we've provided agricultural consulting advice to greenhouses that are 280,000 square feet, I believe is the largest single building I've been inside. The largest single building I've personally managed and operated was 54,000 square feet. And the largest single property that we worked with was um, 50, 80, and 260, so 340,000. So the largest single property we worked with was about 340,000 square feet of greenhouse space. Um, so I feel like I have a pretty firm grasp of what works and what sucks. So that's what I would do. On the small scale, this is honestly probably your best bet. This would be considered a cold frame. They're fairly economical. You can drive the posts in uh, and you just string it up yourself. This is just kind of a random photo I found on the internet, but I pulled this one up because this is the heat flap. So if this was in the summer and you had this much material hanging over, these plants would be extremely hot. And if you went here with a knife and sliced this off, you would literally feel like somebody turned on an exhaust fan and the wind would start whipping out of there. It's extremely crazy how it works. And so you can produce fantastic results out of these style of greenhouses. You don't need to be very expensive. Uh, my buddy Corey, who helped us design uh, the grassroots living soil pots, he was running three of these uh, the year we designed those pots together in 2017, I believe it was. And he had three of these that were a thousand square feet and would get between 80 and hundred pounds out of each of those thousand square foot greenhouses in a simple cold frame, doing the soil that we do, doing the nutrients and foliars that we do and using the grassroots living soil pots that we designed. To give you some consideration, if you go back to the original example of the glass greenhouses on the commercial scale, they're throwing so much botrytis and bud rot away that they're more like 35 to 45 pounds per thousand square feet of sellable flour. Um, you know, they take everybody on a company party if they hit 50 pounds per thousand square feet of sellable flour. And in a basic, you know, extremely low cost cold frame, the homies are doing 80 to 100 pounds. So you don't need all that fancy stuff to have a good result and have good quality. You need to, most importantly, limit hostility and minimize hostility. In the case of uh, greenhouses where you're able to do mechanical ventilation and have some of the other considerations for added amenities of a commercial production facility, in that case, then you want flexibility. And so we advocate having the internal depth, but then also having maybe a shade cloth. Uh, sometimes farms will have two layers of shade cloth and having the ability to be flexible and shade when you need to, open the ridge vent when you need to, seal it up when it's raining and you know just having the ability to do what you need to do as the season permits is really what you need to do. 
And then on top of that, there's a whole bunch of other considerations for ground cover color. It's really common to see a farm that's um, in a hot environment with a black ground cover, and that increases the environment hostility exponentially. So just basic considerations of like using the correct colors for the climate you're in is huge. Uh, I'm a huge advocate of these two products. Um, my personal greenhouses have this one on the left made by Svensson, which is like a hundred year old company. Uh, the product they make is called Solar Woven Ultra, and it comes in different configurations. The one you really want, the, the, statist the stats it has on it is 100% diffusion, and because of the diffusion, you only get 85% transmission. And this is where people get really twisted up is they say, well, if I get glass, I get increased transmission, or if I do clear polycarbonate or clear film, I get you know, 90% transmission or 100% transmission, but you also get 100% problems. And in my experience, you could string this material up over some bamboo stakes and produce higher quality flour than a multi-million dollar glass greenhouse because cannabis absolutely loves this uh, woven product. Um, a newer company uh, or more widespread availability at this point, because I believe Svensson a year or two ago either pulled this product or it became harder to get. I believe they started selling it again. I'm not sure. I bought mine uh, two years ago. But the, the, the one that people are buying now comes from BTL Liners. And I think their website is just btlliners.com. And they have a similar product called Armor Clear. They have a few different products that are woven like this. Um, I believe the one that you want is the Armor Clear, which has 100% diffusion, 85% transmission, the same characteristics of this. And what, what the woven diffusion does is it um, actually breaks up the sunlight. And so when the sunlight comes in, it scatters those particles. And in the case of a clear film, whether it be plastic or film or glass, you end up getting hot spots. And when we come into a facility to try and figure out where there's bugs, and you go to the spot with the bugs and you start doing just some really simple measurement like leaf surface temperature measurement, there'll be little pockets where plants are insanely stressed. And it's not something that your eye can see, but if you go through with a little laser temp gun and, and measure leaf surface temperatures, you can tell that a plant is extremely stressed when its leaf surface temperature is above the ambient air temperature. And so the way you address that as you take a white piece of paper and you take your laser temp gun and get a indirect sunlight measurement with the red temp gun and that tells you ambient air temperature and then you start hitting it on the plants and you can go through your space and find tremendous variation in leaf surface temperature which in my experience 100 percent of the time can lead to helping you determine where the pockets of hostility are you can do this on the indoor and you can do this on the outdoor and you can do this on the greenhouse and 100% of the time, when you go into a greenhouse with a clear film, whether it be clear film, clear polycarbonate, or clear glass, and you go to where the bugs or the mold is, and you take leaf surface temperatures, they're always significantly higher than ambient air temperature, and they're also significantly higher than their neighbors. And it'll literally be like plant here and two feet down the road, it's not. And Whatever it is about how they manufacture those products, it focuses the light like a, um, like a magnifying glass. And so often what happens is in the building phase, people are trying to cut costs and cut corners and they go for these lower cost China made clear films. And then from there on out, you battle plant health problems. And so we're always advocates of like getting the proper material, which I would do this over any other structure 100% of the time if my money's involved. I would get one of these two products, no questions about it. I wouldn't even, there's no way you could talk me into another product to put over a greenhouse to grow cannabis, no way. Um, I guess the only consideration would be an extreme cold. And in that case, like a double wall situation um, is needed or maybe a double wall polycarbonate to try and slow down the condensation. I don't personally live where you get feet and feet of snow. So for me, this is the only thing I would mess with. Um, so. That's, you know, just kind of my opinion there. And this is my own personal garden. I wanted to show you what it's like having the proper Svensson. I don't know if you can read this, but uh, it says Svensson right there, solar woven. Uh, so this is our greenhouses at our house. I went to Haiti 
in 2011 and I saw a country that was devastated and people that were scrambling to figure out how to feed themselves. And that trip forever changed the way I look at the world. And even though I live in California and I'm comfortable, I am ready for the shit hitting the fan at any moment. And so the greenhouses you're looking at are an expression of how I was forever changed by my experience of going to Haiti. And so these are two greenhouses that were built with the concept of what can I build to grow crops today with readily accessible materials for very low cost. And so I just pounded in T-posts and then I you know, took one inch PVC, I attached everything together with hose clamps. And so the longest part of this was pounding in the T-posts. And if I was in a place that had normal dirt, could probably could have done this entire thing in about four hours. Up here in Grass Valley, it's like just rocks and rocks and rocks. And so it took me most of the day to pound in the T-post and it took me a couple hours to build the rest. And so the exercise was, you know, for how cheaply and how quickly can I throw up something that I could grow crops? And this is kind of a standard, this is like my version of what people have been doing for a long time. So a lot of times they do T-posts. Uh, up at the top, it's literally just held together with duct tape. Um, I like using lineman wire and I like to twist it in the drill to make a braided wire like I was a, um, I used to work with a lot of iron workers and that was some stuff that they would do. So I don't want stuff to fall over. So I, you know, twisted lineman wire into a braid and cranked it down with my lineman pliers to put a nice loop on it and then just wrapped it in duct tape. But for decades, people have just been taping together PVC and making these cold frames. Um, up here, I just literally took a piece of cardboard box, wrapped it around the T-post so it didn't cut my um, solar woven material and I just wrapped it with heavy duty duct tape. Uh, down here on the side, this is just whatever wood was cheapest at uh, Home Depot at that period. So this was like a one by three, I believe it was. And that was the cheapest like 16 foot span I could get. And so it's attached to the T-bars with just some one inch single hole conduit clamps and it just cinches it right down. And then um, on the other side where the screw pokes through, I just put a little piece of tape and the only like real quality stuff I did on this was the Spenson solar woven top and then uh, the tracks to hold the solar woven to the wood is the real nice ones, not the wiggle wire, but it's the nice ones that um, protect it so it lasts from year to year. The only downside of these clear films is they do have like a five to seven year lifespan and the hippies get real pissed when you buy in plastic. But if you put this over your crops instead of the cheap plastic, you don't have to spray toxic chemicals and poison people. So I think that's a win that the hippies should consider as a plus minus. Um, and here, this is kind of funny. This is a picture I took uh, this year on the, on the porch. Uh, my wife, Sarah, did everything. So she did the soil amendments. She determined what feeds we were gonna do this year. The only thing that I did was the trellising and the bamboo stakes. She did absolutely everything else this year. I helped her a little bit with canopy management to get things started, but she chose the genetics. She chose from the seed uh, populations. She chose where they went. Uh, she chose what feed, when, how much, and she chose the soil chemistry. So this is my wife's work uh, this year. I'm pretty proud of her. Um, so, but this plant right here, this is a beach wedding, um, pheno that we got from our friend at Lifted Spirit, which is a fantastic plant. And early on in the season, this thing really started growing out. And I said, Sarah, there's a 0% chance that these branches are not going to be laying up against the plastic by the end of the year. And no cannabis farmer on the planet is going to let flowers grow up against the plastic. And I have extreme trust in the soil food web protecting from molds and mildews, but like there's just certain stuff you don't do. And so I wanted to cut these off way, way, way early. And Sarah was like, let's just leave them and see what happens. And about halfway through flower, I was like, you got to let me cut these branches off. But by the time it was halfway through flower, you could clearly tell this was several ounces, if not up to a quarter pound of flower that I would have to be removed. And Sarah didn't want me to cut that off of her crop. So she's like, just keep leaving it. And if it becomes a problem, we'll take it off. And all the way up to harvest, these colas were leaning up against the damn plastic. Not one of them had mold on it. And this plant did not get infested with mites. And so that was pretty crazy. I probably personally would have cut this entire hunk off way early in the season, but that was kind of a fun one. We like to always see what if 
what happens. And this one kind of shocked me. This, um, you know, it goes to show you, like, this is a janky, cheap, thrown up in one day greenhouse that has a nice cover that's not stressing out the plant, causing it to sweat. And it's growing up against the damn plastic and it still doesn't bud rot. But if you go to a $85 million glass greenhouse, you can't even have the plants inside the greenhouse, not touching nothing without turning into complete bud rot. So this plant had a 0% loss of uh, mold or mildews or anything. Um, and this is uh, this was a Cushmints by Blueberry Syrup. This was a really fantastic plant, yielded really well, and uh, has been pretty nice to smoke. Uh, here's some harvest photos. This is uh, Sarah here on the left. She's about five foot tall. This is one of the branches she removed. Um, pretty good fish fish photo of a nice largemouth bass, I guess you could say. And here's me um, with, this was one branch system that we cut off from the bottom. So this Cushman's threw down considerably and Sarah's fertilizing, you know, got some beefy ass plants. So, so if we web, you can see here, I got this clamp um, with the PVC greenhouses, it gets really difficult to attach the plastic material up on the top. If this was a commercial greenhouse, they would have a metal track mounted up there so that you could pull this tight. And so that's the only kind of difficult part about these PVC hoop houses. It's hard to pull the material tight enough to where it doesn't sag. And so I just took a little spring clamp and I rolled it up and I clamped it down because if this hangs over even three, four inches, it'll stop the natural convection of the wind moving up the hot air and it leaving naturally. And you can see on this one, I got it kind of rolled. Um, I took the clamp off here, but there we also use those little half-ass uh, PVC clamps. And here's the hash return. So we this was from one plant. Um, I'm not honestly sure. It came from, uh, it was a Cushmints by Blueberry Syrup that was hunted by our friend Oscar at um, Lifted Spirit Collective. So um, the actual seed pack was Cushmints by Blueberry Syrup. Um, and that shit threw down um, some extremely potent flour and yielded and could not have been more easy going through the entire harvest. Barely needed any staking or structure support. Never was mad. Grew in the shade. Didn't care. Um, yeah, the Cushman's, I guess I should say uh, this Cushman's here. Oops. This, this plant right here grew in the shade and only had about five or six hours of direct sun each day. So it still threw down that much, even though grown in the shade. And then here's the hash from uh, Dakini, which was some seeds that we germinated from our friend James. It goes by Higher Thought Guru. Uh, we hashed about 480 grams of this material and um, got over 60 grams of hash. Um, so we... The hash returns get really confusing because everybody's on different metrics, but what I'm talking about is I took the flour, I hung dry it for a full cure, and then we hand stirred ice um, hash extraction and then just sieved it out in the in the um, bags just like Frenchie does. James um, goes by Higher Thought Guru, came out and actually made the hash with us uh, with Oscar at um, uh, Lifted Spirit Collective. And so... This tray right here is just the one plant, the Dakini. So um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was 13% return on fully dried and cured hand stirred ice hash. And this is um, after it's been freeze dried. So this is wet going into the freezer and this is dried coming out into the freezer. And then this is the ball after we've pressed it and um, stored it. And a um, long time ago, I went to a Frenchie uh, workshop and he talked about how when the hash flattens out at room temperature this is ooh la la and so um, you know in a janky ass little greenhouse with PVC and duct tape holding it together um, I mean this is some extremely high quality top notch hash in my opinion so I guess that's uh, all we got for that one. Um, for what we gonna say, I guess um, we could open up for some questions. Um, there's not a lot of questions about greenhouses. Got some homies saying, what's up? What's up, Mr. Minor Canada? I don't know if y'all got some uh, questions about greenhouse. Um, what up, Wesley Pipes? Showing in to the greenhouse.
We have a question about compost here. So it says, what is the best way to inoculate 15 yards of municipal compost? Should it be done before or after it's laid down? Um, I think, you know, you know, the deeper question is like, what do you, what's your goal with this um, municipal compost? Are you trying, are you trying to take that compost and make it of higher quality? Are you trying to take that compost and make it biologically complete? Uh, we've done a lot of work with that and that's, that doesn't pan out usually very well. Um, so if you're trying to improve the quality of that compost, you're probably not going to get too far uh, with that, honestly. Um, so then the default would be how do you inoculate that, um, which is just the way we always do, which would be an extract. So I guess maybe clarify what you might be asking there. Um, we got some nice congratulations for the flower that Sarah grow. What up? What up? Coming in late, but here. Thanks for joining. And um, yeah, thank you. It was nice. Sarah did a fantastic job this year. So, so if we web, baby. So I'll give it a couple more seconds here to see if there's any more comments coming in. But in general consideration for greenhouse, the first goal is minimize hostility. Don't trap air. Use a proper diffused greenhouse cover. You want to also minimize hostile colors. So if you have black pots, black floor, floor covers, that's a complete disaster. You gotta get rid of that. Um, I would not buy a structure that does not have roll up sidewalls. I would personally not buy a large structure that does not have a ridge vent. And the main consideration is I've so far seen zero out of however many farms be able to overcome mother nature with an electrical fan. And now here in 2022, we just experienced $500 wholesale pounds in the greenhouse light debt market. And if you're doing a sealed greenhouse with mechanical ventilation and a very heavy electrical bill, you're just flat out gonna be losing your ass in that situation. And so you either need to consider um, not using mechanical ventilation or have a ridge vent and, let, and work with mother nature, not fight against mother nature. So yeah, I guess that's all about all I got for y'all here tonight. Uh, join us next Wednesday. We'll be doing another Science Bro. Um, we had a quick question. Oops, sorry, I guess a little fast. So there's a question about outdoor environment, and this is tricky. I will say this is the one real difficult thing about outdoors that also we experienced. And caterpillars are ridiculous, and the hoop houses don't really help, to be honest. And this is a difficult one because there's not a lot of options for dealing with caterpillars. Uh, wasps do seem to kill them, but you know we had wasps in our greenhouses this year and they just kept stinging the crap out of me. And there was still a few caterpillars here and there. So even with us, who this is our job, who manage environments and plant situations and nutrition to avoid bugs, the formula for caterpillars is kind of tricky. And most people either kind of pick them off or people spray one of the BT products. Uh, I myself have experienced stomach issues with gluten allergies, and I think a lot of that has to do with the BT products. The BT products are a modified, um, are a modified bacteria that produces compounds that degrades the stomach of the target pests. Yeah, exactly, and so that's what we do, the BT here. So BT definitely does it. It's just my hang up is somebody that has a stomach that's been eaten away by BT that's sprayed on wheat, not weed, but wheat like flour. Um, I don't personally use it in my own garden. And this last year was the first time I really considered it because we had such a nice crop going and um, you know we didn't want it to get destroyed. Because the thing with caterpillars is they'll burrow in and you get bud rot. And so, we had a few caterpillars here and there. We were able to pick them off. We spend, uh, you know, 20 minutes each day kind of looking through. And then when we went to harvest, we shook the plants off and we didn't have any bud rot. So I don't know if the bud rot comes from more comp compromised soil food web situations, meaning the soil's anaerobic, leading to, um, leading to anaerobic conditions, which would make rotting phenomenons either. So I don't know which came first, the rot that the caterpillar is chasing after to eat or if the caterpillar burrowing in is what makes the rot. But we had a few caterpillars here and there, uh, but we did not experience any rot. So to me, it's fairly minimal loss. You know, that's a tough one. I don't, I don't know what else to do other than BT um, or, you know, do some sort of solstice prayer 
and have a Buddhist monk blend it, uh, bless it rather. So I don't know, but we'll look into that. Maybe we'll dig into some of the uh, science bro topics of what to do with caterpillars. But for right now, yeah, a lot of people just spray BT. So.